or you have a follow-up question uh, to any of the questions that I'm answering this evening, please feel free to raise your hand. We, we want to answer questions in-house and online and uh, those who sent me the questions. The first question I want to turn to is 1 Corinthians chapter 8. 1 Corinthians chapter 8. I have two questions were sent to, to me from this, from this text. Uh, let, me, let me read it first, and then uh, I'll try to answer the questions. Uh, 1 Corinthians 8, verses 1 through 5 are where the questions were taken from. It says, Now concerning things sacrificed to idols, we know that we ha all have knowledge. Knowledge makes arrogant, but love edifies. If anyone supposes that he knows anything, he has not yet known as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, he is known by him. Therefore, concerning the eating of things sacrificed to idols, we know that there is no such thing as an idol in the world and that there is no God but one. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords. So the two questions that were given me was, Question number one, <clears throat> why does Paul say there are no idols? Example, Ezekiel 6, verses 4 through 5, when Scripture refers to idols. Why are there no idols when, when Scripture refers to idols? Now this, I believe, is taken from verse 4. We know that there are no such things as idols. A better translation of this is that there is that, that an, a better translation of this is an idol is nothing. We know that an idol is nothing. Paul's point here is that idols are not real, not that people don't make idols. Okay, his, his point is idols are not real. There is no real existence behind the idol. That's, that's his point here. There's no real existence behind the idol. The second question comes from verse 5. Mormons use this verse to support their demonic heresy that there, that there are many gods which they claim to become. What is Paul referring to in this text? The reference is to so-called gods, so-called gods. In other words, Paul is, is, is referring to the pantheon of the Greeks and Romans. The pantheon of the Greeks and Romans. Paul is saying, hey, look, plenty of gods out there as far as the, the, the uh, Greeks and the Romans are concerned. The universe is full of gods, full of lords. Just look at their pantheon, it's clear. But again, Paul's premise here is that there, are, there is no such thing as an idol, that idols have no real existence, they're just statues. All right? Excuse me? Last thing you said, they're just what idols? I said that they're just statues. Yeah. Oh, okay, go right ahead. Okay, this is a question online about your sermon, the beginning of June. Beginning of June, okay. <laughs> Taking me back. All okay, right. so they said they didn't understand what you stated about T.D. Jakes. Um, and could you go over that again, please? You might not remember that. But, I don't remember. Um, and also what you stated about baptism. Wow. Um, <coughs> what did I say about T.D. Jakes? I don't remember. I do remember mentioning T.D. Jakes. I'm sure I said he was in error. Uh, <laughs> whatever I said. Uh, that he, he was in error, that he was wrong. Um, I, um, I can give you this person's information, and you can refresh and contact them if you want. Okay, okay. I, I, I can, <laughs> you'll do that, fine. Okay. Yeah, um, uh, 
T.D. Jakes is, is, a, is, a, is a oneness Pentecostal, so he doesn't believe in the Trinity, uh, so he's not, he's not in, in conjunction with historical Christianity. He, he's in error. He's a false teacher. And so um, that's pretty, pretty clear. He's not, he's not somebody that, that, he's not somebody that, that uh, Christians, true Christians, genuine Christians should be listening to. He's, 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 a, he's, a, he, he's, a, he's an error. He's, he's, he doesn't agree with historical, biblical Christianity. Um, I'm sure I said something along those lines, but, uh, but I'll, I'll get back with this person with a more uh, substantial answer. And uh, baptism doesn't save. I'm not sure what I said about, about baptism, but uh, baptism, of course, does not save anybody, but it is an important part of the, of the Christian experience. Let me go on to, to e, another question. Years ago, a Sunday school teacher, apparently at our church, was trying to argue that f forgiveness should only be granted when the offender asked to be forgiven. I cited Luke 23, 34 as evidence that Christ wants us to initiate forgiveness. The teacher's response was, this was a prayer. So the question is, was I correct inciting this scripture? Was it right for, for this individual to use this scripture as an argument against the idea that I simply must wait for the offender to come and ask for forgiveness? Luke 23. Luke 23. Thirty-four says, but Jesus was saying, "Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing." So my answer was, "This was a prayer, yes, but that does not invalidate it, especially in light of other texts like Mark eleven verse twenty-five. What does Mark eleven verse twenty-five say?" Mark 11, verse 25 says, And whenever you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone so that your Father also who is in heaven may forgive you your transgressions. So here Jesus encourages believers to forgive when they're praying. If God bring, brings to mind somebody who sinned against them, forgive them. But they haven't come and asked for forgiveness. Well, do they have to for you to forgive them? I would argue that they don't have to. Now, should they? Yes. If you're struggling, should you confront them? Yes. The, the idea that the Christian has to wait for somebody who sinned against them to come and ask forgiveness doesn't understand the full scope of what the Bible teaches on forgiveness. Not only is, not, not only is Luke... 17 true but Matthew 18 is also true in Luke 17 of course the sinning brother comes to the one he sinned against and asks for forgiveness in Matthew 18 the one sinned against goes and confronts the one who sinned against him and so the Bible puts weight on both parties going to seek restoration, not just one. So I, I think that that person had a wrong perspective on forgiveness and confrontation. They missed the boat on that one. Let me keep going. Another question I received was, is there any scriptural evidence that the saints in heaven are praying for us on earth? Is there any scriptural evidence that the saints in heaven are praying for us on earth? No. No scriptural evidence I'm aware of. Another question. Matthew 23, 29 through 33. In, is Jesus is Jesus suggesting some sort of 
generational guilt. Hmm. Is Jesus suggesting some sort of generational guilt? That, that, uh, generational guilt, of course, is the idea that your daddy sins and it's taken out on you. Or your great-grandmother sinned and it's taken out on you. Is, is, is Jesus indicating that? This is Matthew 23. Matthew 23, verses 29 through 33 is what they asked about. Uh, let me see, Matthew 23, 29 through 33. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you build the tombs of the prophets and adorn the monuments of the righteous. And say, if we had been living in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partners with them in shedding the blood of the prophets. Consequently, you bear witness against yourselves that you are sons of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up then the measure of the guilt of your fathers. You serpents, you brood of vipers, how shall you escape the sentence of hell. Mm. Okay. So is this some type of generational, generational guilt? The key here is Matthew 23, 32. Matthew 23, 32. Fill up then the measure of the, of the, uh, of the guilt of your fathers. Uh, you notice they added the phrase of the guilt in, in, your new, in the New American Standard. Fill up then the measure of your fathers. So what, what's, what's going on here? Well, in verse 32, we learned that they, were, that, that they were in fact not just the children of people who killed the prophets, but they were walking in their father's shoes. See, this is the key to the whole, I think I've, I've, I may have answered a question on this years ago on uh, Jesus, uh, God visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children for four, for four uh, generations. The issue is that the children are living like their father for four generations, <laughs> okay? So it, it, it's, it's not God taking out judgment on innocent people when I say innocent, of course, I'm using that loosely. Obviously, no one's innocent. But they didn't commit the, the sins of their fathers. Here in the text, Jesus is saying, fill up. This is a statement that's referring to their rejection of Jesus as a prophet. They're, they're presently rejecting Jesus as a prophet right now. And so, like their daddies, they're the same way. And so... They were, they were rejecting Jesus, the prophet, capital P, just as their fathers rejected the prophets, little p. That's why Jesus calls them in verse 23, uh, yeah, uh, verse 29, excuse me, hypocrites, hypocrites. The hypocrisy is they're doing the same thing their fathers did. They, they, they are rejecting the prophets sent by God. Jesus, of course, is one of those prophets. Yes, follow up. I have a follow up question about the um, the four generations. I was listening to somebody recently, and they said that some sins have multi generation effects, and that's what was being talked about there. Yeah, I, I mean, well, then why stop at four? Why not go to 10? I mean, that doesn't even make any sense. Um, I'm, not arguing that, I'm not arguing that some sins don't have generational impact. That's not what God is saying. He's saying, I'm going to visit it on him. Not, you know, your father is an alcoholic, which led to the family breaking up, which led to a divorce, which led to y y uh, y uh, your mama being on the streets, and uh, you uh, were, were taken away from your mom and raised in, in foster care, and then you got married, and uh, you had to uphill. I mean, the, sure, you can, you, you, you can talk about effects of things that have generational impact on them. That's not what, that's not what God is saying 
in, in uh, Exodus 20, what he's saying is that, is that uh, God himself is going to visit the, the, the consequences or the sin itself, the judgment of the sin on the four generations because the four generations are doing what their daddies did. Not that they're walking around being faithful to the law and then God just slaps them down. <laughs> that, that, that's not the point. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep going. Uh, another, th another question was uh, given um, based on James chapter 4, verse 8. James chapter 4. James chapter 4, verse 8 says... Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. James 4, 8 tells us to cleanse our hands and purify our hearts. How can we do this when Jeremiah 17, 9 says, Our hearts are deceitful and desperately wicked. Well, we have one or two things going on here. Um, either we have uh, James uh, calling uh, people who are unconverted to repent, which of course re uh, repentance and salvation brings with it the cleansing of the human heart. And so he'd be, he'd be calling them to salvation. Or if he's talking about saved individuals, we have to realize that we have a new heart. And although our heart may be impacted by sin, it still needs to be cleansed or purified on a regular basis. As Jesus said in John chapter 13, although we don't need to be saved again, we, we, we already received a bath according to John 13, but we do need regular cleansing because our feet are in the world and we, we still struggle with sin. And so uh, this would make sense both either describing a saved or unsaved person, the, uh, the unsaved person needing to to needing, needing uh, to get saved and the saved person needing to have regular cleansing from sin, which of course we all need. All right. Another question based on Philippians 2. Nine through eleven. Therefore also God highly exalted, uh, verse not 9 through 11, yeah, therefore God also highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven and in earth and under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Question, man is always looking for a way to avoid yielding to Christ. The wording in Philippians 2, 9 through 11 would seem to give man that option. What is the true meaning of the word should? Should. This is an interesting question. Uh, sometimes we have a challenging situation here. Uh, first off, let me make note of the fact that this particular text is quoting from Isaiah 45. Isaiah Here we have a, um, well, let me just read it in, in, it, in, it, in its uh, context. Gather, you, uh, verse 20, gather yourselves and come, draw near together, you fugitives of the nations. They have no knowledge who carry about their wooden idol and pray to a God who cannot save. Declare and set forth your case. Indeed, let them consult 
together who has announced this from of old, who has long since declared it, isn't, is it not I, the Lord, and there is no other God beside me, a righteous God and, and a Savior? There is none except me. Turn t- to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. I have sworn my, by myself the word has gone forth from my mouth in righteousness and will not turn back, that to me every knee will bow and every tongue will swear allegiance. And so here we have God himself referring to how the peoples are going to respond to him. This is, a, this is a sign of his dominance, his control, and his power. Paul then used it again in Romans chapter 14. Romans chapter 14. Let me just drop into um, verse 9 of Romans 14. For to this end Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. But you, why do you judge your brother, or you again, why do you regard your brother with contempt? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. So he moves into the future. Verse 11, for it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall give praise to God. So then each one of us shall give an account of himself to God. Now, what we see in Romans chapter 14, as well as in Philippians 2, is a clear reference to Jesus being described in the same way that that the God of Israel is described. In other words, this text was obviously describing Yahweh in the Old Testament. And then Paul takes that scripture and says, you know what, it applies to Christ. He is the old, he, he is the God referred to in the Old Testament. Of course, we know the God is a triune God. I think Brother Earl will be teaching on that sometime uh, in next month, I believe, on the uh, triune nature of God yeah, on Sunday evening. And so our God is a triune God. And uh, so, G- so Paul here is making a statement as to the, the divinity of, of Christ. He puts it, however, in, in Philippians 2, he changes from a future in in. In, in the Greek text, it's called a future indicative. They shall bow and they, and they, and they, shall, they shall confess. He changes it to what the Greeks, what in, well, in, in English too, in Greek, in the Greek and English, is called the subjunctive case, which is uh, uh, subjunctive tense, excuse me, uh, which is showing potential. Potential. So his point here. Is he's, he's, he's not saying that you can get out of making this confession, but Paul is, is referring to a future event and putting contingency on it based on the context. So God is doing this so that this should happen. He's not saying that, that, that people can get out of it. He, he's saying that, that, that God, is, God, is, ele- God is, is elevating Christ now. He's, he's, he, he, uh, Christ first humbled himself, he, he came to the earth, he took on human form, and then God exalted him with an intention. What was, the in, what was the intent of God? That every knee should bow and should confess. And the, 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 the contingency is, is tied to the, to the future looking nature of what's going on. Uh, this has caused some people, uh, in fact, if you, some, uh, some versions some versions of the, of the English Bible <coughs> will just take the shirt out. Just take, take out the shirt. And just say, just, just say that e- every tongue confess. Because in the context, it's not, it's not trying to argue for a, a way to get out of confessing. It, it's tying the confession to the future. And Paul frames it here in a little different way than he frames it in the other texts. It's a little bit more complicated. The answer is somewhat complicated. If the, if the person wants to contact me personally, I can go through more detail with them. But it's, it's all in the Greek tenses that are used here by Paul. Let me continue to answer questions. Uh, the next question I w- received was in Second Peter chapter, was regarding Second Peter chapter 3. Uh, 
2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10. It says, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief in which the heavens will pass away with a roar and the elements will be destroyed with intense fire and the earth and its works will be burned up. So the question I was asked is, can Second Peter 3 verse 10 be used to show that no works will get anyone into heaven? Can this be used to show that no works will get anyone into heaven? I think it, it, it would be all right to use this verse. Um, I, this, this, wouldn't be my, this would not be my first verse I would go to. Uh, if, you, if you're using the, the New American Standard Bible, you'll, you'll notice that there's a note in the margin of your Bible. And the uh, note says, next to and its works, and you, you, you look in the note and it says the works in it. The works in it. Right. Uh, this seems to be a reference to everything about the earth and it's, and it's including what we would call works, the works of men. And so, uh, again, this verse is usable, but it wouldn't be my go-to verse. My uh, go-to verse is in Romans chapter 3 as to the fact that you cannot be saved by works. Another question. Is there any scriptural permission for a Christian to ever command, decree, or rebuke anything or anyone in the name of Jesus? So there's a couple of places in the Bible where this language is used. I'll give you them. Uh, Zechariah 3 verse 2 and Jude 9. In, in both of those cases, humans are not using that language, all right? In Zechariah 3, um, it, it's, uh, it's, it's, it, God is, God is uh, talking to uh, Zechariah, and, uh, and then in Jude 9, we have Michael. Michael is rebuking the devil. So, I would just I would just encourage uh, people to question the idea that this is this is language we should be using. Uh, even if you found the language in the Bible somewhere, and I guess it it, the, it, it can be somewhere in the Bible, um, we don't have any texts that normalize that for us. We, we we have no texts that say we should be doing that. All right, uh, ju just because it's in the Bible doesn't mean that we're supposed to do it. There has to be a directive for us to, f to follow it or to, or to do it. And uh, I just don't see that. Uh, again, I'm, I, may, I may be missing some verses, and, and I definitely, uh, you can contact me if you, f you find a verse, and we'll try to deal with it. Yeah, yeah, it, 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 yeah, when I, when I preached through Jude, I argued that Jude 9 was invalidating that type of thing, that, that people shouldn't use that language, shouldn't, you, shouldn't try to do that, because the false teachers were, 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 were uh, meddling in things relative to that. Uh, not necessarily that they were using that language, but that was, that was kind of things that they were associated with. You know, yeah, yeah. so I, I, would, I would agree with you that, that Jude 9 seems to be directing us away from that type of behavior as, as human beings. But again, so, so many people just ignore the Bible. It's just crazy. Uh, Genesis 10, okay, Genesis 10, verse 5. I think this may have been related to VBS. This question. This year. In Genesis 10, verse 5, we have a reference to more than one language. Verse 5, from, from these, the coastlands of the nations were separated from their lands, every one according to his language, according to their families, and, and uh, into their nations. And then in Genesis chapter 11, verse 1, we have a mention of one language, 
11.1 says, now the whole earth used the same language and the same words. And so this person's question is, Genesis 10 verse 5 makes reference to more than one language, but Genesis 11.1 says that there was only one language. Please clarify. <clears throat> Years ago, I preached through, I did a series on the great commission, and I spent, I spent about 10 sermons on the nations, the idea of the nations, and um, trying to help us understand biblically the nations throughout, throughout Scripture. Many, this was many, many years ago. But one of the things I talked about was this section of Scripture and how it relates to each other. Genesis chapter 11 and the incident with the Tower of Babel, or Babel, however you say it, precedes Genesis 10. It precedes Genesis 10. Genesis 10 is not a historical note. It's a, it's a uh, historic, it's a anthropological note, meaning it's not just the language problem. You have all of these, these nations dividing from themselves, which G Genesis 11 verse 1 clearly says they were all one, this is just one group of people. And so it's not just the issue of language, it's the issue of geography <laughs> that's all over Genesis 10. And so that's led most biblical scholars to argue that Genesis 11 and the incident with, with the, with, with the uh, tower is the, cause, is the cause of Genesis 10 and Genesis chapter 11. It's the cause of the separation into languages, nations, and, and regions. Now, uh, not to put any pressure on our media department, but uh, that rather lengthy series is not, is not on the app yet, so <laughs> uh, there's a whole bunch of sermons that are just uh, in, in the ether <laughs> yet to be put on the app. I don't want to stress the media department out, Cable and Aladdin. But um, <laughs> hopefully they'll be put on the app in some time, and you can listen to that series where I discuss the nations and how the nations work biblically. But we would argue that chapter 11, verse 1, through verse eight, verse nine precede what's going on in Genesis 10 and Genesis 11, 10 and following. All right, let's keep rolling. Another question I received was, did the Lord instruct Cain and Abel what to offer to him? If so, where is this recorded in the Bible? Okay. So, it's not recorded in the Bible. Let's just, let's just get, that out, get, get that right out in the open, right up, right up, right up front. It's not recorded in the Bible. So, what's going on here? I would argue one of two things. Either they were instructed and it was not recorded for us, or they were simply to go on God's own illustration of slaying, uh, slaying of an animal in Genesis 3. So God's solution to Adam and Eve and their sin was to slay an animal and clothe them. And so either Cain and Abel were to understand from that act that the slaying of animals, the sacrificing of animals was the proper course, or God did at some point talk to them about the sacrifices and it's not recorded for us. I mean, <laughs> if you go back to the story itself, which is, of course, in a chapter, a chapter four, not only do you have to answer the question of what was brought, here's another question for you. Why was it brought? Y you, don't, you don't have a record of God saying, bring a sacrifice. All you have is they're just bringing it, all right? So uh, clearly there are things that God has said to them that are not recorded for us in, in, in the Scripture, and they're acting from that record. So, so either, either there was instruction that we don't have recorded for us, or they were supposed to understand that based on God's own slaying of an animal. Brought something related to what they were responsible for. That's 
far as the area that uh, when it says in uh yes it describes Abel being a keeper of the flocks and Cain was a tiller of the ground. So both of their sacrifice came from their area of responsibility. So it could be a heart issue and not necessarily the fact of what he brought. Yeah, yeah, it, 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 and some people handle it that way. Yeah, they, it, 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 it could definitely be a, a heart problem uh, that it, it, maybe it wasn't the sacrifice itself, but it was, it was, it was the heart attitude. Um, but it seems that God is wanting Cain to bring a sacrifice more in line with what Abel bought um, from this from this text. Yes, go ahead. Uh, in uh, Genesis 4:4, 4, 4, it says Abel on his part also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of their fat portions. That to me just seems uh, to be extremely explicit. Too specific in the what to be a guess. <laughs> look at fat portions. That language is. Is tied to sacrifices biblically. Yeah, I mean, w- clearly when you get to the, to uh, to Exodus and, and following, that's what you sacrificed. Yeah, yeah. Uh, again, I, I, my tendency here is, uh, I do know there are some people who appeal to, well, God illustrated it, but my the way I handle it mostly is that um, God clearly communicated something to them and and uh, they they either complied or they, they didn't comply. All right, I'm going to continue to answer these questions unless there's questions in house. Another question I received was based on Romans chapter five. Romans chapter five. Okay, so based this is this is the question based on Romans five. Several things resulted from Adam's sin. Several things resulted from Adam's sin. One, sin entered the world. Two, death through sin spread to all men. Number three, death reigns until now. Question, is there biblical evidence that Adam was, Adam was truly saved? If so, where? Where? And then they included a little note for me in their question. <laughs> Adam's, name, Adam's name is conspicuously missing from the, hall, from the faith hall of fame listed in Hebrews 11. Okay, so what do we, what do, we do with Adam? All right, so first off, I, I, I would say that, that a, 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 a person's place in heaven is not necessarily tied to whether they appear in, the, in, the, in Hebrews 11. There's, there's quite a few people whose names did not appear in Hebrews 11. Not every, not, every saved, not every saved person appears in that chapter. I would also say that whether a person places Adam in heaven or not, they're doing so by speculation. Either way. I tend to believe that he is in heaven due to the sacrifice of the, of the animals offered on his and Eve's behalf, which resulted in the animal skins. Why is it that God can dress them in animal skins? He killed animals on their behalf. Um, I would argue that, that that's, that's sacrificial there, that God was sacrificing those animals on Adam and Eve's behalf. Interesting question. I was talking to Brother Earl about that question this this, this morning, and he was he argued that uh, based on how Adam and Eve named their children, they named them out of faith, believing in the promise of the coming one, which clearly is the case, and and so that evidence is faith on their part based on the promise. That's, a, that's an interesting argument. Another question. The Lord told Abram, Abram to go forth from his country, his relatives, and from his father's house in Genesis 12, verse 1. However, Abraham took others with him in Genesis 12, verse 5. I think this is partial obedience, sin. Is my assessment correct? 
is my assessment correct? Well, I, I, first off, I think it's undeniable that Abraham took his uh, nephew with him. A lot, obviously, uh, goes with Abraham, um, and they leave their land and go to the promised land. Was Abraham's decision to bring Lot partial obedience? Interesting question. I will say this, as I thought about this, thought about this question. As you, as you, as you work your way through the story of Abraham in, in beginning of Genesis chapter 11 and following, there, there clearly is a separation between Abraham and Lot that takes place. Uh, it's, it's, it, it's painted for us in very graphic terms in Genesis chapter 13, where the two of them separate and go in their separate ways. Uh, so what we can say at least is, is that even if it was partial obedience at the at the time, eventually, God brought him to the place of full obedience. By the time we get, but by, by the time we get to Genesis 22, of course, Abraham, under the confession of God Himself, is the obedient one, who's willing to sacrifice even his own son. Yes. But not how the option, not how could the person hold that, and, and even your response. But in verse 12. I mean, verse 4 of chapter 12, it says, well, back up to verse 1, it says, uh, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I show you. So that was the command he told him specifically. But in verse 4, it says, So Abraham went forth as the Lord had spoken. So him taking his, his nephew with them, according to this text, doesn't seem like he violated the, what the command in verse 4. In other words, there's nothing in verse 1 that prohibits him from taking someone. Uh, and in verse 4, it doesn't seem like any disobedience is acknowledged. Well, definitely no disobedience is acknowledged. Is acknowledged. Yeah, I, I made the same conclusion that, 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 that you did, actually. As, as I read this this afternoon and kind of thought about it, um, God counted what he did as obedience. And... and uh, Remember, Abraham didn't write in this text. This, isn't come, this, isn't, this is not coming from Abraham. This is coming from Moses. This is coming from Moses under divine revelation. And so, uh, the bringing along of Lot, while it might be difficult to uh, understand the why behind it, uh, again, I, I would just appeal to, to uh, I, obviously Martin brings up an excellent point, but I'd also appeal again to, to uh, chapter 13, and, and God brings about the separation of, of the two, and, 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 and the final confession about Abraham by God in Genesis chapter 22 is that he's, he is the obedient one. But um, Abraham definitely fulfilled the heart of this directive, which was to leave, and he left his father's house. He left his land, he left his father's house. Um, now, uh, you, someone's gonna say, of course, that he took along a relative. Was he supposed to leave his wife? Obviously not. <laughs> <laughs> Again, that's what he says. As the Lord has spoken, so I would say, no matter what kind of speculation, he did, Abraham did as the Lord has spoken. You know, his behavior was consistent I mean, ain't no way you can get around it, as the Lord has spoken. Because if he chapter four is pretty powerful. Uh, uh, verse four is pretty powerful uh, as a as a as a witness of what he did. That that's that's Moses's that's Mo that's Moses's description of his actions under divine inspiration. Yeah, go ahead, brother. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. So with Lot, when we understand the culture of the day. He fully obeyed God because he did leave his father's house. He left his kindred. It doesn't say that he called up Lot and told Lot to come along. It says that Lot went with him. We don't know if Lot independently decided to come along and he brought him. I mean, but it doesn't matter because they never traveled solo. 
they, when he left, he left probably with an entourage anyway, with his wife, his family. He probably had servants and stuff. Had yeah, servants yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it, it, it's pretty clear that by the time Abraham leaves Ur, after the death of his father, um, Abraham has a substantial household. Yeah. And uh, Lot being a part of that household, or at least wanting to hitch his wagon to it, I mean, that, that, I, like you were saying, I, I don't think it invalidates Abraham's yeah. actions. And, and, and again, uh, what, what, what the Bible affirms about it is he, he did what he was asked to do. Yeah, and I also wanted to mention, isn't it Peter who mentioned that Lot's righteous soul was tortured? By yeah, it is Peter. On. Yeah, it is Peter in Second so, Second Peter chapter two. Yeah, so Lot is validated. So I don't think you can call it a sin when Lot is validated by Peter. Yeah, he's 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 a, he's a righteous man, yeah. as, as according to what 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 what, what Scripture says. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. You have a question? Speaking of the mic, sister. <laughs> we, we've been micless for a little while. Hope, hopefully, the people online are not too upset at us. Okay. Would you say, um, I heard someone else say this, but would you say that Lot um, is a cautionary tale to us today in how we order our lives? So they were, their argument was Lot chose the land to live in unwisely because he was close to sin, like rampant sin. Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, you, you you don't get any idea from the story that he's that he's purposely trying to be next to Sodom. Um, what you what you do get is that Lot has a lot of animals and goes f for the best looking fields because he's got to feed his got to feed his animals. Now. Part of the geographical layout was Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah were also there, and and I mean, a lot is a challenging story. I mean, you 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 have the statement that our brother referred to in Second Peter two at the at, at the, in 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 the New Testament, but when you read the story of Lot in Genesis, ouch! I mean, it's it's a pretty. I mean, he goes to the region. He eventually ends up in Sodom, <laughs> and, and, and his wife is reluctant uh, to leave. He leaves with his daughters. They get him drunk. They have intimacy with him. He has, ki they have, kids, by, he has kids by his daughters. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a sordid tale, but you, but you have to kind of end up where Peter ends up in Second Peter chapter 2. Their, their point, and I'm sorry, I didn't clarify this. Their point is, in today's time, instead of organizing our life around, say, the church, that people move to, similar to what you were saying about Lot, they move to areas that are a great school district or where their friends are, and church and um, living a godly life aren't priorities. It's the things that are their first priorities. I think that was what they were arguing. You're not going to get an argument against that from me. I mean, I, I mean, I, I, I think that I think that the last people think about is where they're going to attend church, and that's the last on the list. And and what tends to happen is they just well, what's the best one we can find around here, you know? And they just start going, and without any type of concern uh, about uh, maybe making church the first thing on the list, and then evaluating everything else based on that. You, you aren't going to get much fighting about that from me. Uh, next question, a meaning of 2 Corinthians 12, verses 9 through, 9 through 10. 2 Corinthians 12. Famous text, obviously. Maybe I should read the context. And because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, for this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, to keep me from exalting myself. Concerning this, I entreated the Lord three times that it might be 
but that it might depart from me. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my, about my weaknesses, that the power of Christ may dwell in me. So the uh, question was about the meaning of verse 9 and 10. Now, this person bailed me out big time because they said they were not necessarily interested in what, what the thorn was. <laughs> Thank goodness, because I don't know what it was. <laughs> so I'm glad I didn't have to research that one. But um, the, the verse 9 and 10 is, a, is an important, uh, obviously that's his, the climax to what he's saying here. And so this is how I described these, these verses, just, just in, in a short statement. Divine power is more clearly seen in human weakness. Divine power is more clearly seen in human weakness. Let me, let me kind of give you some statements here. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 7. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Why? that the surpassing greatness of the power may be of God and not from ourselves. And then chapter 10, verse 17. But he who boasts, let him boast in the Lord. Weakness and all the things that make for it are what, are what Paul embraced because it made clear that what was accomplished was from God. Although Paul, like ourselves, didn't necessarily like the pain and suffering, it did not mean that he could not see the hand of God in the pain and the suffering. Uh, just, let me just share one more text with you, then I'll go to the next question. Judges chapter 6 and, and 7. In Judges, in Judges chapter 6 and 7, we have the uh, story of, of um, Gideon. You know the story of Gideon, so no, I'm not going to read a lot of this, but uh, God finds Gideon. Gideon is a scaredy cat, and uh, God gets Gideon to the place where he's finally going to uh, fight. That's chapter 6. In chapter 7, Gideon raises an army to, to go against the Midians. I'm going to pick it up in verse 2 of chapter 7 of Judges. And the Lord said to Gideon, the people who are with you are too many for me. <laughs> to give Midian in, in the, into their hands. Watch this. Lest Israel become boastful saying, my own power has delivered me. And so God has to, to cut a whole bunch of people off of Gideon so that they're in a state of weakness. Therefore, when the victory comes, they can't say, we did it. And so I think that's in line with what's going on in Paul's statement. Yes, go, go ahead. Yeah, I just have a couple of quick questions um, regarding the tribulation and end times. I've heard a couple of sermons recently that I just wanted to kind of clarify a few things with mm -hmm. you. Um, so in Daniel 9, the seven-year period it describes, um, that, that in case of tribulation, is that right? Let me, let me, let me get to the text first. In Daniel 9, I assume you say 24 through 27? Correct. And you want, and what's the question? So that, I uh, really verse 24, that's the tribulation that describes the tribulation, is that right? No. Okay. The, the uh, 70 weeks, so the 70 weeks describes a block of time with the last week being the tribulation. So the 70th week, the 70th week, these are 69 weeks. The 70th week would be the tribulation, not the whole 70 weeks. Okay, so the tribulation is one week? Is one week. And, 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 and so what, what does each week represent? Each week represents seven years. So, so 
each day is a, is a year. And the, the last week, like the other weeks, is made up of seven-year time periods, because each week is seven years. And that's all broken down in Revelation? Excuse me? That's all broken down, like, in Revelation? So, in, in Revelation, all, all, not all, but a lot of what you see happening is in that 70th week, is in, is in that last week. It was in, the, is in that seven-year time period. Okay. For example, when you're reading through Revelation, you'll, you'll, come, you'll come to, like, a, like three and a half. Well, that's, what is three and a half? It's half of seven. You, you'll come to, uh, what is the figure, 12, what is it, 1,200, what is it? Is days? Yeah, days, I forget, that it's, it's 12, 1,200 and some odd days, I think it's 1,260 days or something, something like that. That's, that's three and a half years. So that's, that's half of the seven, that's half of the, that's half of the week. Okay. And so all of, the f all of the numbers that you see, not all the numbers, but m many of the numbers you see in Revelation are describing this last, this last week, the 70th week of Daniel. Gotcha. Okay, yeah, that's good. Um, in First Thessalonians four, so uh, which is about those who died in Christ. Yes. Um, this is this indicating all believers here are, are being raptured at this point. We would argue for the rapture here. Yes. Okay. Well, l l l l l l l let me say this. Everybody believes in the rapture. Mm -hmm. Even people who are covenant in their theology believe in the rapture. They just have it at a different time than we do. So, so there are three views on, 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 the, on the rapture. Pre-trib mid-trib and post-trib. So um, we would argue, of course, for pre-trib. So yes, th this is referring to the rapture. And then the tribulation starts like at that point. Yeah, that's what we'd that's argue. Right. Mm -hmm. That's right, okay. Um, one of my last questions. So what about, Mar what about Matthew 24, 29 through 31? I may have already asked you about this a while ago. Matthew 24? Matthew 24, 29 through 31. Starts with, um, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon yes. will not give us light. And then verse 31 ends with, um, they will gather together his elect from the four winds. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's such a, so after the tribulation, the elect are gathered together. So could you just... Uh, so um, I, I would encourage you, I, I preached through Mark's gospel, and so in Mark's gospel he has a, a similar section. I preached that whole thing in great detail, but let me just kind of summarize. So the church age at some point will come to an end with the rapture. The, the dead in Christ will rise first, and then, and then we'll meet him in the air. This will trigger the tribulation. Daniel's 70th week. What the, what the Bible calls the time of Jacob's trouble. During this, during this seven year time period, people will, will be coming to Christ. So you'll have a bunch of converts. Some of those converts will be killed by the Antichrist. Some of them will make it all the way through the tribulation. At the end of the, the tribulation, you have the return of Christ second coming. He stamps out the Antichrist and the beast, gathers the elect, and begins the millennium 
for a thousand years. Does that help? Yeah, so the elect are those who were converted. We're, we're converted the during the seven year time period who made it all the way through, who weren't killed. Right, and then back, back to your diagram, so you got the rapture and the two arrows. Yeah, um, it, really, it really should just be one. Yeah, was, well, was well, well, not one. It, 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 I shouldn't have, I shouldn't have, I shouldn't have brought it all the way to the earth. I should have done like this, because okay. because he, he's not coming to the earth. Right. And I should have extended this all the way to the earth. Just had it backwards. This should have come all the way to the earth. Second coming. That's good. Thank you. Yes. Uh, you can pass the mic mic back to our sister. Um, Pastor Scalpel. Yes. Uh, could could you just really define what is the tribulation and will the people of God be judged after the tribulation or when? Excellent question. So the, uh, the tribulation is a time of judgment on, on the world. It, it's also called the, the wrath of the Lamb. Uh, this is where God is judging the world um, for their sin and bringing, bringing his plan for Israel to a conclusion. So God had a plan for Israel. He's concluding it. That's where, Daniel, that's where Daniel 9 comes in. In Daniel 9, Daniel lays out God's program for Israel. The 70 weeks. God has decreed 70 weeks to fulfill all that he said f for Israel. While the first 69 weeks were boom, 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 boom. Between the 69th week and the 70th week is what we're in now. We're in, the, we're in a huge gap of time in between those two. The 70th week will, will start the, and will include a time of judgment on Israel and the world, and then that will be culminated with Christ's return. So that's the tribulation. And the second half of your question was? Okay, yeah, but, but, yeah excellent, excellent question. So, um, what, what the Bible teaches is that when we die, we're judged at that time. However, there is going to be the great white throne judgment, and, and that will be the, uh, the judgment of all the unsaved people. So, we're being judged as we, as, as we pass. And, and, and as we enter heaven. And, and uh, so our, our judgment is not waiting for that time. In the great white throne judgment. <coughs> at, the, at the end of the thousand years. And so at the end of the thousand years will be the, will be the great white throne judgment. You're welcome. Yes. Okay, question. What would your response be to someone, so Matthew 5, Sermon on the Mount, that said, um, if they argued that up until verse 10, it was talking about believers. Matthew 5, you said? Mm hmm But beginning at verse 11, it's talking about ministers <laughs> and so I'm sorry, I'm sorry for laughing I'm sorry I, I should <laughs> I should never laugh at people's questions okay so um, part of the reason for the argument not mine but part of the reason for the argument is that up until verse 10 or ending in verse 10 is plural and then started in 11, it's singular. So when it's talking about um, persecution, we know that all believers are persecuted, but that ministers, pastors are persecuted differently. And that the salt of the earth, and so going from 11 down is talking about ministers, not lay people. I'd have to look at the Greek behind that. Yeah. I'd, 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 I'd. Uh, I could pull up the Greek text here, but my time is almost up. So, but uh, uh, why don't you save that for some other time, and I'll, I'll try to answer that. Uh, but uh, I would say no. Um, surely ministers aren't the only ones gonna, who are, who are, who are going to be rewarded in heaven. That, that wouldn't make any sense. 
Um, yeah, I mean, uh, just off the top of my head, without looking at the Greek, e e and, and, and even if it even if it was even if it changed from a plural to a singular, as you know, singulars can be a corporate singular. It, it, it doesn't have to mean an individual person. And so it, 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 it can mean a corporate entity, particularly in the context, I would argue, like this, where he's with, where all around it, all around it is, is, is clearly referencing believers as a whole. So, but I, I'll try to get to that. Uh, I, only, I only have a couple more minutes. Yes, go ahead. Yes. It's for, it's, for, it's for the people online. Uh, but when we die, are we immediately just in, what, I, I guess my question is, so what happens when we die? Wow. Whether okay. saved or excellent, excellent unsaved. Question. So when we, when we, when we die, and, and this is based off of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, when we die, we go to be, we go to be with the Lord. And part of being with th the Lord is the judgment seat of Christ. And Paul clearly understood that uh, in, um, in 2 Timothy chapter f 3, that his death would, be, would, would lead to his r reward. And so, that's, so based on those texts and a few other texts, we argue that the, when the believer dies, he goes to be with the, the, the Lord, and he receives his reward at that time, which, which of course, comes with his evaluation. In reference to unbelievers, uh, we would argue that the unbeliever is uh, basically sent to, to Hades and remains there in judgment until the great white throne, where he's, where he's then judged and sent into the lake of fire. And so that, that's how we would argue for, the, for, for those two individuals. Excellent question. Y yes. Well, uh, Pastor Skeppel, um, did, did I hear you correctly? When we die, if we go into heaven, we go right then. Yes. Okay, because... And, and again, that's based on, on 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Okay, so that's what I need to look back at, 2 Corinthians yeah. chapter it's 5. Where it says to be absent... From the, from, th from the body is to be present with the Lord. Because I thought we didn't, I thought that we're just asleep in the grave or wherever we are until the tribulation and that's when um, the Lord comes to wake us up and we ascend then. No, so, okay. uh, so what the Bible, t and, and that is a popular view that has been taught over the years, but what the Bible actually teaches is that when, when we, when we die and our body and we and we when and we exit our bodies using that language we go to be with the lord and so uh our bodies now now the bible does use the word sleep but it uses the word sleep as a euphemism for death so it, it's just saying that you're dead not that you're asleep sleep so we don't believe in soul sleep uh, that's basically what the, the uh, doctrine that that basically advocates for, that some people have believed in, in, in church history, the idea of, of soul sleep, that, that the soul is asleep and uh, not with the Lord at the time of passing. But again, Paul says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And so th that takes place upon our death. Okay, can I ask one more question? You can ask one more question. <laughs> I'm already over time, so it doesn't matter. Go right ahead. <laughs> okay. I, I wanted to know, is hell and Hades the same thing? Um, or it's different? Or there's a difference between So, uh, it, the, the, how people use it is, it, you know, it, a popular usage. So, uh, I, I would tend to say that Hades and hell are interchangeable. Uh, and the, uh, un unless of course, well, I'd, I'd, have to, I'd have to kind of re refresh on it, to be honest. Um, yeah, that, well, lake of fire and is hell. I, I, I would need to, re I would need to, re to refresh on that. Uh, I'm sorry? Yeah. G g My understanding is that Hades was, could be for both uh, unsaved and the same. At, at, at one, one time. Yeah. Uh, prior to Christ. Prior to Christ, yeah. 
And uh, so I would, I would think that they would have uh, some distinction. Okay. Yeah, let me, let me, um, Yeah, let me get back to on that one. We get to look it up later if you want to. I'm sorry? You don't have to look it up now. Oh, I'm not. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I have two more questions here okay. that I'm tr trying to see how I can answer as quickly as possible. What would you say to someone who said people who are students of history are Catholic? Um, I would say that Number one, this person probably doesn't understand history. Uh, <laughs> this is the first thing I would say. And then I would say that um, the, reason, the reason that uh, Roman Catholicism is wrong is not because of history. The reason it's wrong is because of the Bible. That, 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 that uh, those who are students of, 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 of the Bible are Protestant. Uh, what advice would you give to a, a believer you are counseling who is struggling with the continued disappointment and or shame from a particular sin they committed? Um, this is a real pastoral question. Um, I, would, I would first ask them, have they truly confessed it? Um, have they truly repented of it? Um, they might continue to struggle with it, but are they are they genuinely confessing that sin and seeking to abandon it then i would i would argue that they need to understand that christ's blood does cover their sin even repeated sin that we struggle with that christ's blood also covers that and so that's that's what i would say to them all right excellent questions appreciate y'all coming tonight and appreciate the questions from online as well as those who emailed me and texted me questions Let's, let's close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks this day for Christ. Thank you for his watch care over us. Thank you, Lord God, for helping us to understand Holy Scripture, to seek to live in accordance with your word. Help us to really do so more uh, carefully as, as, as uh, uh, a Christians and help us to honor and glorify you, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.